On this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. The bigger picture really for me is because I love to be on stage. I speak all over the country to other physicians for continuing education. And what I'm now doing is I'm getting on stage outside of that doctor realm, but to anybody who wants to listen or get a giggle to motivate, inspire, laugh, and and help people overcome the adversity that they have in their life. And it doesn't have to be cancer. There's tons right, of adversity right. that's not even mm. disease related. And, and just look at things with a perspective that's different because I will tell you, and people are, are going to think I'm nuts, I made cancer fun. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than with me. Guys. Oh man, you already on, said it. I was gonna ask her. She remembered the date. Thanks for joining the conversation today. We are joined by Dr. Cindy M. Howard. Dr. Cindy Howard is a board-certified chiropractic internist, nutritionist a national speaker with a life rich in adventure from professional dancing to title winning powerlifting raised by supportive parents. Her youthful pursuits ranged from the arts to athletics, fostering a resilient and vibrant spirit. Today, she runs a successful chiropractic practice serving a diverse patient base from children to professional athletes, addressing conditions from fatigue to autoimmune diseases. A self-diagnosed Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor, Dr. Cindy authored Positively Altered, capturing her philosophy of choosing one's perspective and response to life's challenges. When not practicing or speaking, she enjoys life in Chicago's south suburbs, and we ain't going to mention which team she roots for, with her family, (laughs) with the motto of trying anything at least once, good motto, Dr. Cindy encourages everyone to dive into life learn and become positively altered so join us to explore her inspiring journey and insight so how you doing (laughs) well listen after that introduction i'm fantastic right (laughs) i mean you pumped me up great so Uh, i I am fabulous thanks (laughs) professional dancer and power lifter yeah yes and not necessarily all at the same time so Uh, okay (laughs) It goes back quite a few years. Actually, my dream was to be a professional dancer and choreographer in New York. And based on your introduction, that clearly did not come to be, (laughs) which, which, you know, after a few therapy sessions, I've come to terms with and it's all good. (laughs) And the powerlifting, I just always had a love for lifting and in the gym. And when I was in college, I met a bunch of um, guys, you know, which when you're 19 that's really fun who were lifting really heavy and they got me very deep into the sport so it, really it became, yeah it became um a hobby for quite a few years and set a couple records in illinois even in bench press and uh deadlift and you know now i you know have my 25 pound dumbbells instead of the heavy ones and you know my kids outlift me so things definitely change as we get a little older were you thinking of olympics or anything at the time Oh, not for that. No, 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 no. It was just fun. It was, you know, it was something to keep you healthy and excited. And, you know, it was a great outlet through college and a little bit after. And I think you're hiding something too, because all right, you said, or I said also professional dancing. Yes. But if you look at your website, it looks like you're singing on there. Sing! Oh no, nobody wants to hear me. That, sing. Okay, so that's you actually no. speaking. It's not saying that was me. Sp- yes, that was me speaking. So the the funniest part about you mentioning that is when I was in high school, I was in the school choir, mm-hmm. and I took three years of voice lessons. And if I even sang one sentence of a melody for you, I could probably get you to have <laughs> zero listeners. I am that good. <laughs> I can clear a room in seconds. It's not pretty. Um, no, that is definitely me speaking and engaging an audience, not singing. I find that hard to believe. Oh, no, it's tr- it's very true. And, and, and I'm not going to prove myself right because, again, I don't want to hurt the show. <laughs> I, have, I have been known to call people out on that when they tell me they, they were a singer. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, thank, no God, thank God they could still sing. Right. I mean, I'll get up and dance a little bit for you, but I'm not singing. So what, actually, what kind of dance 
Modern dance. Modern dance. Modern dance. What yes. exactly is modern dance? <laughs> it, it's everything that is not ballet or jazz or, or hip hop or anything else. So okay, it, it's 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 still an expression of dance. Oh, you know that's a great. I've been so far removed. I don't even know how they define modern <laughs> dance anymore. <laughs> um, but but it, it involves all sorts of different techniques and and whether it's floor movement or jumps. Mm -hmm. um, but just the expression through movement. And I was part of a couple companies when I was much younger. And, you know, it's interesting because the future of that looked pretty much like dance, wait tables, have no money, live in a crappy apartment in New York, starve to death, you know, call dad for 10 bucks because you're out of money. And at some point I decided that just really wasn't, you know, comfortable for me to right. live that way. So, so I got out. Of, I got out of that. Hmm. I guess, you know, you found a field that uh, you're helping others. I am. And I love it. I really found a great calling. I wound up by accident in my profession to a certain degree. It was never a dream. It was never a goal when I was young. And now every day that I sit in the office and talk with people and help them with their health care, it's just not work. I really, I, I love it. It's a happy place for me. Uh, you have to explain that. How is it you, f you fell into it by accident? So my undergrad uh, degree was in exercise physiology because I always loved sport and movement and was always right. involved in that even young. So it was just it, it made sense to do that. And like most kids, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated from school. So I actually applied to the physical therapy program. I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and they mm -hmm. wouldn't have me. Um, yeah, right. Like my, what? I, they wouldn't have me. <laughs> So my grades were not as stellar as they should have been. Ah. And, and mm, right. <laughs> like most great doctors. No. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the grades are not hanging on the wall in my office. <laughs> but at the time, it was actually a very competitive field to get in. So when I had applied to physical therapy school, I couldn't get in. And my father said to me, OK, well, you need a plan. So go into sales. You're going to be really good at sales. So I went into sales and I made a lot of money and I spent every dime that I ever made because I calculated my commissions from the morning and then I spent the afternoon spending it shopping like a yep. nice young lady. Sales is great, but you're right. It's hard to budget your money. <laughs> it's hard to budget your money. And I decided I didn't want to be in high heels and a short skirt when I was 40 traipsing through the snow in the city of Chicago. <laughs> so I needed another plan. And it was interesting after talking to a few people about my love for, you know, that physical therapy type realm. They literally said to me, why would you want to go to physical therapy school and be told what to do by other practitioners when you go to chiropractic school and tell the physical therapists what to do? And I went, oh, I really love to tell people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and that's not really quite how it works in the industry, but right. it, it, it raised a little bit of a, an eyebrow for me or a light bulb. And I thought, you know, let me check into this. So I applied to chiropractic school and I got in. Uh, apparently, the standards at the time were lower for chiropractic than they were for physical <laughs> therapy. I'm not sure what that says either, but it all wound up okay. And I went through the program and wound up meeting um, my mentor, whose name, uh, he, he's since passed, but his name was Dr. Frank Strail. And he taught obstetrics and gynecology in the chiropractic college. Huh? Which, yes, exactly. Because you think chiropractic, neck and back, right? Maybe you yeah. throw in an elbow, a knee, and a, you know, and an ankle. But at the school I went to, which was national in Lombard, Illinois, they teach a very primary care program. So we took courses in cardiology and lung function studies and gynecology. And I went, this is nuts, right? Wow. Like as a chiropractor, we can do all of this stuff. I, I really had no understanding of that. And he really kind of turned my brain around a little bit to go, you know, there's something to this. And that's where my interest went. So I wound up getting a diploma in internal medicine and nutrition. And that's how I practice now. Wow. All right. And, and before we were talking, because I told you I go to the chiropractor. Right. And I've, you know, I was always told you have mixed and straight and you, but you're totally different. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you take the straights and you move them into mixers and then you got the outliers like me who, you know, become more broad spectrum in medicine. So there's room for all of us. It's really great. Uh, explain it because in all, and I told you this before, I was scared to death of, of a chiropractor. And I actually had my chiropractor on and we talked about uh, chiropractic care. Um, but I still think a lot of people are missing the boat. Right, right. Can you explain, because I didn't realize every all the different things that chiropractic care can do. 
I mean, I would I'm, like I mentioned, I went in for the bone spurs, but right. oh my god, it's helped with my arthritis. Yes, it's helped with my head. I used to have headaches. Yes, uh, explain to everybody. I mean, what? I, I want to say it's magic. <laughs> oh no no no. <laughs> No, it's not magic and it's not a religion. You don't have to believe in it. It's based in, it's based in science, you know, many, many years of science. And, and really what we're looking at is structure and function. And when we look at structure and function of the human body, whether it's spinally, which again, most of us look mm -hmm. at, or in my case, a little bit on the chemistry metabolic side, um, for those that dabble on the neuro side, neurologically as well, it's really also about uncovering the underlying cause. So what makes us very different from a lot of branches of medicine is if you walked in with neck pain, regardless of the condition, you know, to a general practitioner, a lot of times that might involve some imaging, but certainly mm. probably some prescriptions, right? Muscle relaxants, painkillers, right? Yeah. That's the typical. We look and we go, okay, how did you get to the spot you were in in the first place? What caused those underlying issues? Was it lack of movement? Was it too much movement? Was it an injury? Is it poor nutrition? Is it a disease process that's contributing to the particular condition that you have. And when we can find those underlying issues, now we make those corrections. And sometimes they are as simple as just spinal misalignment and making corrections, corrections, excuse me, in structure and function. And sometimes it really goes deeper into some of those metabolic or neurological components. All right. So you said poor nutrition. How in the world does that I mean, I, I, that that's the one that confuses me. Okay, so let, let me make it sort of simple, right? Okay. When we look at all of the food that we put in our body, mm -hmm. the idea behind that is you're going to need your certain macronutrients, so your fats, your proteins, and your carbohydrates, and they do certain things, right? Right. Also, what you absorb are different micronutrients, so vitamins, minerals, some cofactors, some what we call metabolites, some fatty acids, and all of these different components of food – nourish our cells, if you will, right? So we've got millions and millions of cells in the body. We learned about them in biology class. Remember that little cell? You had to draw a picture of the nucleus and the mitochondria. And you're you like, did when not just ask this? me if I remembered something from high school. <laughs> okay, well, I guarantee you, you drew a cell at I one mean, point. I failed that class. I guarantee it. Okay, I guarantee it. I would almost put money on that, even though I just guaranteed it. So, so we forget that we use that part every single day. We need to function, right, right? right? So on a very cellular level, if everything is working well in the body, we've got a good immune system. We have little to no inflammation. We've got a response that heals or takes care of any of the bad that we put in. So for example, if you live on fast food and sugar mm. and chemicals, that causes a pretty strong inflammatory reaction in the body, which also can damage the cells, which doesn't allow our bodies to heal. So you fall down a flight of stairs and, you know, you go boom and you sprain an ankle and you hurt your low back. Somebody who's very healthy with no inflammation, proper immune system, great diet might heal a whole lot faster than somebody who is already, you know, screaming with inflammation, let's say with diabetes or an right. autoimmune condition. And now we struggle as doctors because while we do all this good work to help you heal, your body is 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 really fighting us a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when the nutrition is really good, we do better. Now, another great example. So you mentioned neck problems. Did you ever have like any radiation, any numbness and tingling going down the arms ever? Yeah. Well, yeah. My left arm. Okay. okay. Still so do part, once in a while. Yep. So part of that could actually be irritation to the nerve that branches right. out right within the spine. But what most people don't realize is a lot of times that could even be as simple as let's say a B6 deficiency. Uh -huh. And if you're not getting enough B6 in your diet, neurologically, one of the symptoms is numbness and tingling. So really? if, yeah, so as a, as a chiropractor, if we adjust you, adjust you, adjust you, and there's still numbness and tingling, maybe it's really not that adjustment that's not getting you better. Maybe it's really a vitamin deficiency. Get out of here. Shocking, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. And that's where nutrition is so important in all of health. And we forget, you know, and, 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 and we eat, but we don't really think of the, the profound effects that the food really has on our body. So I guess for something like that, well, one would have to get blood work. What do they call that? The lip, lip, well, <laughs> yeah, lip, so, whatever. 
Yeah, so you might be thinking of a lipid panel. So that's part yeah, of that's it. it. So, <laughs> yeah, so in blood work, we do it about, so, so there's really cool ways to look at this. There's basic blood chemistry that a lot of doctors look at. Mm -hmm. Comprehensive mm -hmm. metabolic panels, we check your blood sugar, your liver enzymes, your kidney. There's certain inflammation markers called C-reactive protein or SED rate. We can run cholesterol panels. That's that lipid panel. Thyroid panels in full. But we can also dive deeper and look at those micronutrient levels that I, right. I just right. mentioned. We can look at them in the blood cell and out of the blood cell to see if your like, current nutrition is good or your long-term nutrition is good. We can start running down the rabbit hole to even look at your genetics as to how your genetic makeup will respond to certain nutrients as well. Do you methylate them? Can you absorb them? Then I'm going to get you even further down the rabbit hole and go to the gut and go, okay, now everything that we eat, do you actually break it down? Do you actually utilize it? Do you excrete it well? And if the gut isn't working, you know, great, then I can shove nutrients down you all day long and it's still not going to make an ounce of difference. So our bodies are wildly complicated that way. And yet for those of us, <clears throat> excuse me, that practice that way, we can take all these little puzzle pieces and put them together to really get you so much healthier, you know, in the, in the broad spectrum of things. Hey, it, have you ever thought about starting your own podcast for your business? No, because I'm. That's what why I'm here with you. <laughs> I don't want to edit. I don't want to line up, line up guests. <laughs> I just want to show up and and talk about the things I'm excited but about. You that, do. All. I mean, that's amazing, though. I never. I didn't even know all that. Well, that's why I'm here is to educate everybody. Oh, well, I know. That's the goal. That's, that, well, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> that's probably the main reason I do this podcast. So I can learn something new every day. Isn't that fun? And yeah. and I learned something new from all my patients, you know, in office. Yeah. So, you know, and if How I many... recorded them, we'd be violating privacy. So we're not going <laughs> to How many of them have asked you to dance? Oh. <laughs> oh, what? I'm not telling. Oh. <laughs> I'm not telling. <laughs> I got to make a trip to Chicago now. <laughs> right? You got to you gotta show up to the office to see if we actually dance there or not. <laughs> all right. So your book, Positively yes. Altered. Yes. What inspired you to write the book? Oh, so and this things. is the first book, right? This is my first of okay. hopefully many. Yes, this is my first. So I'm going to give you a little backstory because it's really important to why the book exists. Right. Uh, about 10 years ago, December of this year will be 10 years ago. I diagnosed myself with Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right. How do you diagnose yourself? With right. That? So as a physician... Because I have access to laboratory tests and ordering all of these things, okay. I did it myself rather than making the appointment with another doctor. So I had found a lump. There was a, a lovely lymph node sticking out of the left side of my neck. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of weird. I'm not sick. So I waited a few days expecting to be sick because a lot of times lymph nodes will pop when you're fighting an infection. Oh. And I never got sick. So I ran blood work on myself because I can. And I didn't like what I saw. There were some markers that were just actually a little scary. Right. So I sent myself for a chest x-ray. We found the two lymph nodes in my neck and two in my chest. I didn't like those either. So I sent myself for a CT scan and the report on the CT scan basically um, came back saying suspicious for, for cancer. Wow. So, yep. So at that point, after consulting some other people in my life, I sent myself to the university of Chicago and had a biopsy to confirm the Hodgkin's lymphoma stage 2B. So now you fast forward to get to the answer to your question, because I never answer questions with a yes or no quickly. As Which is you are good. Now learning, I like right? that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's always a story. Yeah. So walking through this entire experience, I decided to journal. And I've used that before in my life as a method to just communicate with myself, let emotions out, think through things. It's always been a great tool for me. And I have zero education in journalism or writing. I mean, you know, I barely passed English in high school because, you know, you have to pass to graduate. <laughs> but I kept this like diary, if you will. And when I went back and reread some of the entries, I realized a couple things. One, some of them were sort of ridiculously funny, which seems odd walking through cancer. And two, they were very vulnerable and raw, which I also had, I thought was very valuable to me too. Because sometimes it's really hard to be that. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in a tough situation, right? To admit, you know, you're failing, you're scared, you're hurt, you know, all of those things. And when I went back and I looked at it, I thought, you know what? There's enough material here 
to actually write a book. And, and a book was always something I wanted to do, you know, yeah. years ago, it was like, Oh, you know, put together a list of things you'd like to accomplish before you're dead. And writing a book was on there and, and never really gave it much thought until this time. So I put the material away actually for quite a few years. And I'm pretty sure that was out of fear. And, you know, am I good enough to do this? Right? right. Are people even going to want to like, do they even care? You know, how much work is this going to be? And eventually I kept going back to this, trying to re rework some of the chapters. And I thought, you know, as cliche as this sounds, and it is cliche, if the book helps one person face a challenge better than they would have without the book, then I'm glad I was vulnerable and put my story out there. Yes. So I'm glad I did it. The bigger picture really for me is because I love to be on stage. I speak all over the country to other physicians for continuing education. And what I'm now doing is I'm getting on stage outside of that doctor realm, but to anybody who wants to listen or get a giggle to motivate, inspire, laugh, and, and help people overcome the adversity that they have in their life. And it doesn't have to be cancer. There's tons right, of adversity right. that's not even mm. disease related. And, and just look at things with a perspective that's different, because I will tell you, and people are, are going to think I'm nuts. I made cancer fun. You're not the first person I heard say that. Yeah, I mean, I they, they they say laughter is the best medicine. It works. Yeah, it works. And I, I needed I, I walked through this for six months. And if you think about a six month period, which in the grand scheme of my 54 short years on life, uh, you know, on this earth, it's not a lot. But when you're walking through it, it seems like a lifetime, right? Yeah. When things are difficult. So finding the joy and the gifts in it. Really, I look back on it, and don't get me wrong, I do not want to do this again. I've paid my dues. I've right. had my experience. But I, I I don't unwish it for myself either. Like, I'm actually really grateful that I had that opportunity to learn what I learned through that because my life is so much better for it. Yeah. You know? Uh, when, when you actually found out that you had cancer, what was your first reaction? Because I know you didn't say, oh, I'm just going to go journal right away. Can, can I say a swear word on the podcast? Yeah. That's why shit. it's a podcast and not on was, radio. <laughs> the first response was shit. I mean, literally, yeah. like, 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 what am I going to do? And the interesting thing was, is when I actually found out or knew, I was in between patients. So I had like 45 seconds to process because I looked at my test results, which was really stupid to do in the middle of my workday. And then I had to turn off my take care of myself brain because I had to go take care of somebody else. Wow. So it became sort of this surreal experience for me, which I know is very different than a lot of people because I almost had to forget about it for a little bit. Wow. Yeah, to move on. Because when I'm in the room with a patient, it is all about the patient. It's not right. about me. It's not about anything else. Like my focus is on you and what you need, you know, to get from that experience, not what I need. So it was, it, it was very strange, you know, to do that. And then I had to figure out how to find the time to turn the focus back on me when I was done working and figure out what I was going to do. How in the hell? Can, I I don't I I just can't imagine. I, I there ain't no way in hell I'd be able to do that. I would have had to call it a day. <laughs> you know I have this philosophy, and I've taught this to everybody that's ever worked with me on my team, and and how I've always focused my life, and that is when I walk through my door of my office, all of my crap stays outside that door. Mm. I yeah. am there to take care of those people that have asked and want my, you know, and want our help. And, and that mantra has always really suited me very well in practice to focus on those people. So when this came, it was sort of the same thing. It was like, okay, just, yeah. you know, put it down on my desk face down. I'll turn it back over, you know, later when I'm alone. And, and I think because I was already prepped to behave that way, it actually was pretty easy for me to do. I'm not sure I would have accomplished that if I, you know, was somewhere else. Right. So when you got home, how was your family when you told them? I know the kids didn't say, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they learned those words pretty young. I hate okay. to admit. You know, we, don't, we don't have a filter in my house at all. So, yeah, I'm, I was never that mom. You know, it was so, – so I actually processed all this by myself for a little bit before I shared with them. I wanted to make sure oh. I had a plan. I wanted to have a plan. Mm. I wanted to be able to sit down with confidence to say, look – you can't really say I'm going to be okay because you don't know if you're going to be okay. Right. I, I don't believe in lying to people either, right? But I wanted to be able to sit down with them knowing that I was going to tackle this and that 
I didn't want them to at least worry from that aspect, right? That mom's got this, whatever the outcome is. And my kids were relatively young at the time. I mean, my, my oldest right now is 21. My youngest is 16. So this is 10 years ago, wow. you know? So, so I don't think they had the full breadth of how serious this was because mm -hmm. I also didn't play the victim card in the house either. You know, yeah. it was like, here's what mom's facing. Um, I'm going to have to go get some treatment on Wednesdays. Thursday, I'm going to work. Friday afternoon, you have to make dinner because I'm going to be tired. And Saturday, I'm going back to work. And that's how it went. So the kids learned to do a few things for themselves, even though they were young, just because there were moments I had to go rest to, to recover. But, but we conducted, I mean, I took them to all their events. I missed one day of work because I fell down a flight of stairs. It had nothing to do with the treatments. We just, we went about our six months as if I didn't have Hodgkin's lymphoma and just made the adjustments where, you know, where we needed to. I'm afraid to ask now, how in the world did you fall down a flight of stairs? <laughs> yeah. So this is another really awesome story because it shows you, you know, the stupid things we do when we're not paying attention. So I was in an office building where I needed to walk down a flight of stairs. They were all marble, gorgeous, hard, Ouch. right stairs. And I was texting because, you know, right? I mean, oh, stupid, God. right? I was texting and because I was looking at my phone, I had a misstep and I tumbled down the entire flight of stairs and I screamed and it was a relatively quiet office building. So nobody came running. Oh, jeez! And when I figured out that I could get myself up and get to my car, I did. And if you fast forward through the story, the reason I missed one day of work is I was in such excruciating pain from, from a sprained knee. I actually thankfully didn't break anything, but I had sprained my knee pretty bad. I was in so much pain from the, that coupled with the pain of the tumors in my chest lysing or breaking up at, at the time that I was undergoing treatment, that the next morning I woke up and I couldn't even roll over to get out of bed. So I called in sick to work, which I have never done up until that day ever, and had to, you know, come up with a plan in order to get through that day. And the next day I was back at work. Did you finish the text? Of course. <laughs> Of course. Now that's a silly question. <laughs> you're, like, you're texting the person or like, what the hell? Why is she saying right. ow? <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, listen, I got to oh be like God. the cool kids. We finish no matter what. Yeah. You know? That's Absolutely. just, man. I, you know, and I guess maybe those years of you being athletic and everything probably helped. Well, I didn't really tuck and roll the right way. Let's oh. put it that way. <laughs> you know, or the knee would have been, you know. It would have been in the fetal position a little bit better to protect the knee. <laughs> yeah, so but it, I mean, it could have been a lot worse, especially on oh, marble steps. Absolutely. Could have hit my head. Yeah. You know, yeah. Could have fractured a whole bunch of things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was, I was very fortunate and, you know, like anything else, it was probably a lesson for me to stop and slow down, you know, and sometimes we get handed those things that are gifts to say, you know what, you're moving too much Yeah. and you need a little rest. And I only took 24 hours to rest, but you know, it was needed. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. It's important. Okay. So the title of the book, Positively yes. Altered. Yes. How did you come up with the name of that? That was super painful. And the significance I, of it. Yeah. It was super painful, actually. So the original working title of the book was called Pregnancy is Worse Than Cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And You'll in one of the chapters of my book, I, I talk about my pregnancy with my my first child, my daughter Reese. It, it was a horrible pregnancy. I'm actually lucky to be alive. I almost died giving birth to her. Oh my God. She was in the NICU for seven weeks to the day. I mean, the story is it, it's really phenomenal because she's this amazing human now that flies airplanes and you know is is oh yeah, she's this little powerhouse that you'd never wow. know was two and a half pounds when she was born. So my pregnancy, and I outline this in a chapter, was so much worse than my personal experience with cancer that that was the working title. Well, when I ran it past a couple of people, they actually got offended by it. They're like, you're belittling people's cancer experience. And I said, no, for me, that was my truth, right? right? Not, not anybody else's. For my truth, it was worse. Well, I didn't really want to offend anybody, at least outwardly. I probably offend some people. Not outwardly in the book, but I didn't want the title to turn people off in order to pick up the book. Yeah. So yeah. we went through, I had about 200 different working titles and nothing really like wowed me at that point because I was so set on the original one. 
So I, I was working with, with a gentleman by the name of Johan who did all of my branding. And he sent me this enormous questionnaire that drove me nuts because I had to answer all these questions in order to brand myself. And when I answered one of the questions, and I don't even remember which one it was, I had said something about, I want when people to read my story or hear my story to become positively altered. Oh. And I went, that's it. That's the title of the book, Positively Altered. And the tagline of finding happiness at the bottom of a chemo bag was there so that you do know there's a bit of a cancer story in this when you pick it up. Okay. So you're not surprised. And I wanted it to be almost a little funny because there's a lot of funny in the book. You know, it's well, yeah. not just a how I survived cancer. Right. <laughs> you know, there's more to it. Yeah, and which is it. good because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're, the audience for this book is definitely people that are going through cancer or have sure. gone through it. Or even somebody, like if I know somebody that's going through it. And that humor helps. It helps. But if you're going through a bad divorce, if your job sucks, if you're just down in the dumps. Which is like a cancer. Correct. So you substitute the word cancer for any other adversity that that Mm -hmm. you label as something negative. And how do we turn that around? How do we find the joy? How do we overcome? How do we look for the other side? And you can replace those words. You know, it doesn't have to be cancer. Let's take a little break here. So I can tell you about something that, um, well, if it wasn't for me starting this, I wouldn't be here doing the podcast. And that's HartfordCountyLiving.com. I started HartfordCountyLiving.com back in 2012, and it's a good, positive news website. Nothing negative on it whatsoever. That's all it is, good, positive news. I also feature different businesses on there, artists, authors, a little bit of everything. It's all about Harford County. Harford County in Maryland has so many great things to offer. If you're out of state, out of the country, you come here, I guarantee you, wherever you go, you're going to love it. And if you live here in Harford County, if you haven't been out to see everything, what are you waiting for? You need to get out there. Again, go to HartfordCountyLiving.com, check out all the good news, and if you own a business, if you would like to be a sponsor, contact me because the sponsors of HartfordCountyLiving.com also give some added benefits. They are also the sponsors of this podcast, Conversations with Rich Bennett, amongst some other things. I always throw surprises in for my sponsors. So again, go to HartfordCountyLiving.com. So how long did it actually take you to write this? Well, oh, I don't know in in, in man hours or girl, girl hours, I guess, <laughs> right? We got we got to use the right gender these days. So in girl hour in girl hours, you know, the, <laughs> told oh you there God. was no filter here. <laughs> you know, the journaling was the six months, right? Because that was right. from start of treatment to the end of treatment. Probably the last two years, I've spent rewriting chapters, working with developmental editors and copyright editors to clean it up to make sure it's presentable you know, all the way through publication. So the last two years I've really spent doing that whole project from pulling it back out right. to, you know, now it's available to purchase on Amazon. And now are you self-published or did you go through a publisher? Um, I went through a production company that helped me self-publish. So kind okay. of a little bit of a hybrid a bit. Um, so I did all the right, as far as we know, right, right steps right. in that whole editing publishing process but then it was uploaded to to Amazon and Ingram Spark, which is you know where the the bookstores and whatnot purchase the book from, mm-hmm. in order to get it through that facility. Now, is there an Audible version as well? Uh, there is. It's not available yet. So I okay. it actually it's sitting in my inbox to make sure all the corrections are perfect. I haven't checked that box yet. So we're hoping that'll be available in the middle of October. Did so, are you did you do it yourself? I did, and it was horrible. What? No, it was so hard. It's so oh, hard. hard. I thought you said horrible. Well, I did because it was hard. Oh. <laughs> but I had, I actually had, so, so this gentleman, Stephen Coghill, who did the recording with me was wonderful. He walked me through the entire process, but you know, I'm, I'm not an actress, right? I don't, I don't do copy for commercials. So when you do this for the very first time, it's, it's almost a little scary because you have to listen to yourself talk and the inflection right. and you doubt you know, and then I cried through a couple and I'm like, should I have cried? Should I not have cried? 
but it, no, it's it's my voice through the entire from start to finish, except the um, the very end is my three kids reading the little bio about me. So you Aww. will get a taste of the three kids as well. You didn't take the crying out, did you? No, you can sort Good. of tell where the tears are. Good. Yeah. I, yeah. And then I think it adds to it because I'm sure there's times when you were laughing as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some of the things are just ridiculous. I mean, you will look and go, she did what? She said <laughs> what? Why would she do anything like that? You know, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody. And then there's certainly a lot of sad in there. I mean, I was walking through through a bad divorce. My mother was terminally ill at the time. Oh who we've since lost. The dog oh, died sorry. of pancreatic cancer. I mean, right. I mean, like I had the sob story thrown at me all at one time. So there's a lot in there, too, where you think, oh, my goodness, like, how did she get through this? Yeah. You know, I'm just grateful it was all thrown at me at once. I didn't want to do it over 10 years. You know, I got it over with in, you know, six, eight months. So yeah, you perfect. definitely have some more books in you. Oh, for sure. Without for a sure. doubt. So how did you decide which stories uh, and experiences to include in the book? Yeah. Because so I'm sure you didn't include them all. <laughs> no, there's some private moments in there <laughs> I can keep for myself. There are some. There's okay. No I pulled the ones that I thought resonated the most with me mm -hmm. because, again, of that ability or that desire to be vulnerable. So if I took all the vulnerability out and saved that, then the purpose would have been lost. You know, yeah. then it just would have been a here's what I did to overcome cancer. And maybe, you know, you can do the same things or maybe you can't. And the book was really not meant to be prescriptive in that way. I mean, I do tell you some of the things I did and if they have value, great. And if they don't, don't. But this is not a how to get through Hodgkin's lymphoma right. book. So I had to leave the funny and the vulnerable in there a bit so that it stands out in a way to serve that purpose of, yeah. of even just entertaining. So uh, something I'll, I love to ask, especially uh, with somebody that's going through something like this, um, on your, your mental health, because mm -hmm. I know it had to take a toll on it, mm -hmm. but writing the book, mm -hmm. did that seem to help? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. So one of the things, and I'd love to back up a little bit too, because I think this is super important for people yeah. is when I diagnosed <laughs> myself, I would say I have cancer. Mm -hmm. And a dear friend of mine, Wendy, one day said to me, because I didn't want to be perceived as sick. That was really important to me because I'll tell you, I was never sick. Right. Okay. She said, stop having cancer, experience or walk through cancer. So oh. when I talk about it, you're going to hear me say I experienced Hodgkin's lymphoma. I walked through Hodgkin's lymphoma. I never had it. I never owned it. And that was the start of that mental health journey for me in a positive way, because since I never owned it, 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 it wasn't that powerful, right? Yeah. I, I, I took away the control and the power that the disease would have over my mental health. And I took the mental capacity that I was capable of and, and overshadowed the diagnosis by walking through it. I love that. Yeah, those words were extremely life changing for me, and I've since passed them on to you know to many people who who have also said the same thing that those you know words have so much power that when mm -hmm. we use the right ones, they can be life altering. Yeah. So now when you sit down and you write, and it's it, it's actually very interesting. So writing again was always very healing to me. So it helped me process through the emotional component of what I was going through. But in a weird way, even today, it's interesting when I read certain chapters of my book out loud at book readings or signings or, or whatever I'm doing, some of them are actually hard for me to get through the words because it stirs back up some of the, the, the mental component of what I went through, knowing perfectly mm -hmm. well I might not actually have completely put that away and compartmentalized it yet. Yeah. There's still things in today's, you know, Cindy, right, my life today, that that stirs up where I go, oh. I'm still working on that lesson and I'm not happy about it, <laughs> but I'm still working on that lesson and pay attention because there's a reason that those trigger that emotional side that sometimes isn't always positive. So before you wrote the book and when you were going, you know, walking through cancer, I like right. Um, what were you doing? Was it something else besides just the journaling that was helping with your mental health? You know, I think um, friendship, super important, mm, yes. right? Like I, I recruited some really great friends that I, you know, always joked were part of my superhero team because I needed to have people to call on when I needed them and I needed yeah. people to step away when I said I need to be alone. So so friendship was essential to me. 
Um, I think exercise was another really great outlet for me because I had always been involved in some sort of health and fitness. That was a great outlet, you know, to, to, to go to the gym and beat the crap out of weights when I was pissed because, you know, I was walking through something I didn't want to walk through. So fr- friendship and exercise were two great outlets. But yeah, you were able to exercise even through the chemo and all? Absolutely. Why not? I don't, I, I've always heard that. I mean, people just get like downright tired. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the homework we all also need to do in, in terms of the treatment. So when I chose chemotherapy, which was actually very hard for me because I practice natural medicine, like right. chemo's poison to me, right? I would never touch chemotherapy. And yet Hodgkin's lymphoma is 85% curable, not remission, but curable utilizing chemotherapy. Really? Yes. So when I had to come to terms with using that modality, and I did make the choice to do that, I also said, I'm going to clean up the mess that they're going to create in my body. So I was doing very high doses of IV vitamin C the day before, the day of, the day after. I was doing a ton of supplemental nutrition. I mean, I was popping about 100 pills a day, which I know sounds excessive, but this is what I do, and I I knew what to take. I was eating perfectly. No gluten, no dairy, no sugar, no processed foods, no chemicals. I mean, everything I made at home so I knew the quality was good. And I basically cleaned up the mess they created. So... I never, I never had vomiting. Um, again, I only lost the day of work because of the one incident wow. I shared with you. I literally went for, I would go to work on Tuesday. I would have treatment on Wednesday. I went to work on Thursday. Um, on Friday at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I would be exhausted. I would go to bed early. I was back at work Saturday and I repeated the cycle. And I think because, actually, I don't think I know, because of all the good nutrition work and the things that I've mm-hmm. been practicing for tw- almost 25 years, I got myself through it beautifully. You, you, you never would have known I was walking through this if I didn't tell you. You now, would have had no idea. Is that in the book? It is. All right, good. It, yeah, good. It's, all, it's all in the book. And it was, it was really important to me to do that for both levels, one for myself and two for my patients, to show yeah. patients that there, there is a better way to walk through illness besides what, you know, one doctor somewhere tells you with a prescription medication there you've got to build a team and you've got to ask questions and you've got to find what resonates with you that works. And and what are your goals to get through it? Because if the doctors that you choose don't help you with the goals to meet those needs, they're the wrong doctors. Yeah. The wrong team, you know, and, and too many of us, unfortunately, suffer with poor quality through a lot of these, these illnesses to get on the other side. And I I just, I don't believe that that has to be, I think, I think quality is really important. And, you know, I walk the walk. So even though my journey is going to be different than everybody's out there, I mean, it's never going to be exactly the same. You know, I, I, I can show you, it can be done. I think you need to take your practice like throughout the country and just travel and do it. (laughs) They got to come to me. (laughs) I'll 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 fly. I'll run around the country speaking, but for practice, you've got to come in and see me. Do it like <laughs> that. I'll take all the tools. Do it like me. the guy that's got the YouTube channel that's always cracking the, the, the athletes, the wrestlers and all that. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, if, if, if one of the TV shows wants to, re, you know, reach out and do a reality TV series with me, I'm up for about six episodes. I mean, I, you know, I don't know that I want to do it for life, but, <laughs> you know, we, we can do a short series of events and I'll travel, you know. So do you actually have a favorite chapter or section in the book? And if, and if you do, can you share a little bit? Yeah. So boys don't like to wear panties. <laughs> it's my favorite chapter. Right. Oh, they get, they get wait, worse. Wait a yeah, minute. That, first. That wasn't... Oh, okay. We'll go back to that. Then. Why is that your favorite? So the chapter talks about an experience I had with my kids walking through Victoria's Secret. And the reason it's my favorite is it was a very benign, not important event that had a very big message. And yet it was it was a, a moment I got to share with the three kids in the middle of this experience that just was it just was simple. And it, it had nothing to do with illness and it had nothing to do with stress. And it was just a very real moment that actually was very funny um, plus now that I published it, it can embarrass them for the rest of their lives. So, you know, <laughs> keeping the therapists in business, cause my kids are going to have to go, you know, once people start asking them about the chapters their mother wrote about. I think you're like me. You're the master of embarrassment, aren't you? Oh, why not? I mean, why not? I mean, there are kids we're allowed to. 
Absolutely. And if you do something stupid or funny, why not exploit it? Yeah. I mean, it's the greater good of, of, of giggles. All right. So you sent me the advanced reader's copy. Yes. Now, please tell me, now that the book's out, that all the chapters have the same names. They do. All right. Explain. They do. So all I the names are real. I can't even. I, I just, the, the one I just keep cracking up, Cindy's Food and Poop Rules. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so, so, yeah. So in, in my field, when I travel, I'm actually known as the poop doctor. <laughs> okay. Because you cannot have a meal with me without me discussing your bowel habits. <laughs> we need to, we need, no, it's true because gut health is so important. It's the basis for the immune system. And when the gut isn't healthy, we're not healthy. So I need to know yeah. how often you go and are they long or are they skinny or are they color like, and does it smell if I walk past the bathroom? And do they float and do they sink? And do you see food in it when you're done? And there's a million questions pertaining to poop that are so important. I know, right? Like, it's probably a good thing we're not sharing a meal right now. No, like, this, no, no. This, no here, this is the funny thing because this, like with my kids, if they're sick, I always ask. That's one of the things I always ask them. What did it look like? What color was it? They're like, I said, because it's going to tell you a lot about your body. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And it tells you a lot every single day. So yes. not just when we're sick, but even when we're healthy, it's a reflection on how healthy we are. So yes, I walk through certain rules about poop that you can learn about so that you can get educated and start looking at the, at the poop. And, um, you know, I give everybody, I think my email in there so you can send me pictures to show me good or not good. I'm happy to look at it. The, you know, we can keep we in can... mind. She said pictures. Picture. She's not, yeah, she's not the, the company where you actually send her the Correct. Poop. I don't want a box of pickle material. <laughs> right. I do not. No. There's companies that do that, you know, is bad jokes. So not oh, me. Oh, I know. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah, not me. No, 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 no. Keep, yeah, you can flush it after you take a photo. Yes. <laughs> God. So what, what are some of your favorite chapter names? Because I just love the names of the chapter. Okay, well, see, now I got to open the book. Because now you're. Okay. Gonna, okay, let's see. Chapter names. And how did you come up with them? Yeah, so they really all came out of the content. Okay. Right? So I would have, let's see. So the boys don't like shopping for panties, for sure. I love booby can be a big word. Say that again. Booby can be uh, a big word. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got you to read. Yeah, that's chapter number seven. You got to get the book to read it. Right. It, you know. Um. I think also, there's, so chapter nine is called, if the guitar center sells guitars, what's the cancer center selling? Oh, wow. And, and that one is not on the funny side, but that one talks about, again, the language. So when, when, when and actually chiropractic is phenomenal at this, right? So when you go see your chiropractor, we name our companies after good things. Like I'm Innovative Health and Wellness Center. I noticed, yeah. Right? It could have been Howard Alignment, Right. The, the words in our in our company names are always what you hope to get when you come see us. Yeah. If I call the cancer center, I'm not calling to get cancer. I'm calling to get well. Right? So mm -hmm. in medicine, a lot of times we have all of these negative words. And again, that comes back to the power we give words that, that, that run us down that mental health rabbit hole of the wrong direction instead of welcome come on in we're going to get you better these are all the fun things that we're going to do and you're beautiful and you know cancer does not define you and that's a pretty long title for for a business but <laughs> if, if we can abbreviate that a little bit i think we're on to something yeah you know it, it's interesting i got a newsletter once you know md anderson is a big big center for cancer right and they have a newsletter and on their, I believe it's even on their website now, like it says MD Anderson, you know, cancer center. And there's a big slash through the cancer. So I'm like, oh, they're starting to get it. Right. I still don't want to see the word cancer in there, but they're starting to get it. Right. Mm -hmm. It is. We've got to change the language. So that's a, that's a favorite title for me for that reason. So <laughs> I, I just love the chapter. names. <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. You're going through the book. So you got to find more now. I am. So the two martini accidents. So Okay, that, don't tell me you fell down the stairs again. <laughs> no, that, that's how I got pregnant with my daughter. Oh, Jesus. And it, she was, I think it was only a couple years ago that she actually found out she was an accident. And now, of course, oh, her God. brothers make fun of her all the time. She was a welcome accident, but she was an accident. Right. Yeah. 
So, so that was a good one. Oh, oh, the duplex theory is another one of my favorite titles. The duplex theory. See, all these titles make you want to buy the book, doesn't it? Because yes, you no it does. Because about. now it's staring the minds like, what in the world is the duplex theory? Right. So the duplex theory. So at, at eighteen or nineteen years old, I came up with this idea that when you fall in love with somebody mm-hmm. and you think you want to spend the rest of your life with them, buy a duplex. You're on one side. I'm on the other. The lock is on my side because it's my story. You can come over for dinner. You can come over for sex. You're obligated for weddings and business events. And other than that, get out. Keep your house. You know, you can keep dishes in the sink. You can keep dirty socks on the floor. I don't want to tell you when I'm going to the grocery store because it's really not that important. And the whole philosophy behind that was, is we get so caught up in the minutia sometimes of living with somebody and all these little things that wind up driving us nuts about the person we fell in love with. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the other side, I actually can get excited to see you tomorrow because I didn't let you in today because I locked the door. Interesting. So I would like to create an entire complex of duplexes for people who are falling in love to see if we could lower the divorce rate. If people could stay together longer, because I do believe we're designed to walk through this, you know, this life with another person. I'm just not so sure we're designed to do it in the same, you know, 2,500 square feet of space. Yeah. Give or take. It's, I have something similar. My thing is, and I always told my kids this, I tell everybody this. Number one, never marry the person you can live with. Marry, <laughs> marry the one you can't live without. That's great. And I tell people, if you live together, that's fine. But before you get married. Have one of you move out for like six months. Mm-hmm. And, and if you are both miserable, <laughs> then yes, that's right. the one to marry. It'd be interesting how many people are not. Oh, no. Probably yeah. too many. You think? I do. Oh, yeah. I, I have do. a funny feeling too. <laughs> yeah. You know, th- there was an, when, when I walked through, because I also walked through a, a, a pretty bad divorce at the same time that I was walking through cancer. And there was really a profound statement that a a very close friend of mine had shared with me. And it was, I never want to be needed. I want to be wanted. Ooh. Yeah. And it was also really interesting, too, because, again, as as adults, we really shouldn't need another person to fulfill something, or right? We should be very capable ourselves. We should want to spend that life together, Mm -hmm. helping each other, lifting each other up. And if we really actually need them to do that... Then we probably have to look back inside ourselves and go, okay, what are we missing that we're looking for a need to be fulfilled yeah. that isn't? I like yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Um, so even though this just came out, how's the feedback been so far? It's awesome. I love it. So I love it. I, I'm asking people to share, and I really mean that. Like good, bad, ugly, I want I want your response. And it, it, it's fun to see people who just really enjoy it because it's it's entertaining but it's also fun to see when people are sharing messages that they're forwarding to other people who are struggling yeah. and, and that this really it's, and I know I sound like I'm giving everybody a sales pitch here, but it's a great gift, right? Mm-hmm. It, the, the book is a good gift. Even if you don't give the whole book, even if you just take a picture, one woman who was at my, my book sign, one of my book signings the other day, last week, she took a picture of two pages that I actually read and she forwarded it to her father who was going through a challenge and he was so excited because it helped him with the decisions he was making to know he wasn't alone in his mindset and his choices. So the feedback to me is just, that's again why I put it out there. It's just really fun to see how people are benefiting. Yeah, well, I've seen a couple other authors actually do that now on social media. They'll take a photo of a couple pages and post it. And then yeah. it's where you can read it. And then, of course, you get pissed because it's like, <laughs> shit. What happened here? You know? Right, right. Which makes you want to buy we, the book. Right. And we do that too. If you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, mm-hmm. we post little excerpts from the book all the time, you know, for that reason, to, to, to get you interested, but really mostly to inspire you. Just yeah. think a little bit differently. So before, before we wrap up about the book, um, <laughs> I try, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to... Well, we are, I mean, because we are, I already asked you about your audience for this book. And I think your audience is everybody, in all honesty. 
Um, it is on some levels, yes. Yeah, because I think with the humor and everything, I wish, in all honesty, I wish this book was around when my mother was going through cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book that we read, well, the book that I read that helped me was The Secret, but another one that I mm-hmm. read and then I passed it on to my mother and everybody, and the book got passed around so much and it helped a lot of people was Tuesdays with Maury. Oh, I quote that in my book. Oh, really? Sure, because you know what? I had the pity party for a few minutes, mm-hmm. right? I had the pity party. I would sit on my shower floor going, really, what did I do to deserve this? And why me? And 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 this isn't fair. And I played that game, right? But But I set a time limit to do that. And then I spent the rest of the time figuring out how to make it fun and overcome. So I love that book. And actually, I'm familiar with both of them. I think they're great. We have to manifest what we want. And and Tuesdays with Maury is a phenomenal message. Oh, yeah, yeah. phenomenal. Mitch yeah. Albom's just and uh, oh my god, I I don't <laughs> I haven't read a Bay a book from him. No, because it was that one. To. No, and that was the first book I read from him. And then it was the Five People You Meet in Heaven. Yes. And uh, there was another one I just read recently. The I think it's the Stranger in the Lifeboat. Okay. Or something like that. And if you haven't read that yet, you got it. You have to read. Okay. Actually, let me ask you that because as an author now, now that you're an author, um, difference between an author and a writer, right? Who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, I, you know this question always comes, and I always, I always struggle. Um, David Sedaris is probably one of my favorites. I love the way he tells a story. Um, you can pull out an individual chapter and just read it without even reading, you know, from cover to cover. And I think that's really fun. Other than that, and I know this is going to sound terrible, but I don't really have a, like, I don't follow a certain author where I read mm-hmm. everything in the sequence, but I will tell you, I love trash. Like trash. I, yeah. Like fiction trash. Like I just love like the no brainer. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I just mean like, because I'm so in medicine and reading journals right. all the time, like I don't want anything that requires following 32 characters, and I don't want anything historical where it brings me back to history class that I didn't like in school. Like I just want to read about, you know, like Susie who went to the beach and there was this hot guy and she fell in love, and then you know he wound up having this mystery life behind the scenes that she knew nothing about. And I go, "You're stupid. This was coming, right? You know, like that, that." <laughs> That sort of no brainer where you can get through a book in two hours on a beach yeah. and at least just be really entertained. So, you know, for me, that kind of stuff is, is really fun. <laughs> oh, I got a lot of authors I can turn you on to. <laughs> so now, tell I, me, I, I, I will tell you though, my daughter has turned me on to Colleen Hoover and a lot of, she's in college and a lot of the girls are reading her books and don't ask me to read all of the titles because, you know, menopause, I can barely remember yesterday, but... <laughs> A pile of her books are sitting and I've been through a few of them and those are, they're, they're really fun. They're very, very well written. And, and she's just, she's really easy to just enjoy. Huh. Colleen Hoover. Hoover. Okay. So I tell everybody have- where they can get your book and your website. And if they want to fly to Chicago, <laughs> if they want to bring you in as a speaker, yada, yada, you know, all that good stuff. Okay, How do they you get got in touch it. with you? <laughs> you got it. So the book is available on Amazon. So if you just type in, positively altered or even dr cindy m howard it's going to come up you can get it on kindle paperback hardcover and hopefully you know mid-october if the date works for the audio version so that's great if you go to dr cindy speaks just like it sounds no period after doctor dr cindy speaks.com that's the website and you can sign up for my newsletter so you can find out what's going on in my life or what i want to share and you can see all the um, media that I've been involved in. So the show certainly will be on the website as well, too. And uh, there's even a speaker page. So, yes, if you have any needs for speaking, I would love to be considered as a keynote speaker. We'll, we'll bring serious. We'll bring funny. We'll bring medical. We'll bring whatever you want. I'll bring thong underwear. And there's a joke in there somewhere, too, just so you know. Um, I'll, I'll bring whatever you want me to bring. Um, and let's see what was, oh, and then business wise. So the name of my practice is innovative health and wellness center. I'm outside of Chicago, Illinois, actually in a town called Orland park. And the office number there is 708-479-0020. The website for my practice practice, Ooh, it helps when you say the English properly is (laughs) innovative, innovative, H W C 
com. And if there's anything I can do to help anybody out there, just, just ask. And if I'm not the right girl, I'll find you the right girl or guy or, you know, canine to help you through whatever your troubles are. Well, if you ever do any speak engage, engage, <laughs> Renna, I let, gave you my disease. Yeah. Then, right? Any that speaking engagements out here around Baltimore, you definitely got to let me know. You got it. Uh, I will before do. I get to my last question, is there anything you would like to add? Well, I would, but it depends on your last question. So should I say it first? Since oh, I go ahead and say it first. Question? Okay. Yeah, because you're not going to know what the last question is. I don't. I don't. But I may be able to work in this material to the last question. We'll see. <laughs> and then I'll just be redundant. Yeah, here's here's what I would love to do. There's a mantra or a message that I would love for everybody to, to consider. And that's what I call being bolder. B-O-L-D-N-R. B, build your team right? Get the right people to help you through whatever it is you're going through. Oh, open your arms and your eyes to adversity because it's coming no matter what. Mm -hmm. So you got to be ready for it. Take it on, find the love and the gifts. L is for laughter, laugh through everything so that you can get through it. D, don't apologize for who you are and who your decisions. You answer to you. And and if you don't like your answers and your choices, then you wake up tomorrow and you change them. But Mm -hmm. don't let anybody sway you in a way that doesn't feel right for you. And then lastly, R, just be reflective. At the end of the day, I go to sleep and I think for a few minutes, did I make good choices? Did I do the right thing for me today and the people that I care about? If the answer is yes, I drift off to sleep. And if the answer is no, I still drift off to sleep because I'm a good sleeper. But I wake up the next day learning from that experience and doing what I need to do in order to better myself. So I would love for everybody to just consider those things. Um, It's the mantra that I'm hoping to just keep spreading all across the world. I love it. So you've been on several interviews. I have. Is there anything that a host has never asked you that you wish they would have asked you? And if so, what would that question be? And what would be your answer? That's a great question. That's not allowed. <laughs> well, I have to think I have to, you know, cause That's I want right. to be, be reflective in my, in my answer. What do I wish they would have asked me? Hmm. All right. So the funny question would be is, do you, how is your poop? Is your poop normal? Like, do you have good poop? That would have been, nobody's ever asked me about my own poop. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah, just for would, the record. That would have definitely been. <laughs> and just for the record, I have great poop. I poop, you know, one to two <laughs> times a day. It's solid. It comes out easy, by the way one square of toilet paper is all you need because it just should be confirmation you didn't need it in the first place. And I can do that. So my poop is fantastic. Two ply. Hmm? Two ply. No, you don't even need two ply if you've got good bottle habits. No, man, that one ply is too rough. What kind of toilet paper are you using that it's rough? Well, that's what it was when when I was back in Marine Corps. That stuff was like sandpaper. (laughs) If you've got good bowels, you don't even need to wipe. There should be nothing there. Oh, Damn, never mind then. Apparently so I know we were one. probably looking for something super profound there. No, but was... <laughs> I think poop is pretty profound. <laughs> God. Oh, Dr. Cindy, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I God, I can't wait to talk to you again. I'm going to have to have you on again. I would um, love that. We can do that. Uh, well, you, well, you have to come on again when you write the next book, which is, I have a funny feeling, is going to be within the next year. I am 47,000 words into the next book. So maybe not within a year, but certainly soon after. I want to thank my guests for coming on this episode, but I really want to thank you for listening. And I would really appreciate it if you left a review about the show or about this episode. And you can actually do that right from the website. Go to conversationswithrichbennett.com. You can leave a comment about this episode. You can leave a review for the podcast in general. Another thing I would love for you to do, of course, follow us on social media, but send me a voicemail. If there is somebody you want me to get on the show, if you want to come on the show, if there is something you would like for us to discuss, send a voicemail or send an email. If you send a voicemail, if you want, I can actually play it back on the show too. So just saying, Uh, but no, seriously, I, I want to thank you for listening because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't be as successful as it is. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. I want to share an amazing experience I had with Tar Hill Construction Group 
when I needed to install a new roof on my home. Let me tell you, they are truly a cut above the rest. Tar Heel Construction Group is an award-winning residential and commercial roofing and exteriors contractor, focusing on roofing, siding, gutters, and solar solutions. Proudly serving Baltimore, Harford, and Cecil Counties, they make it their priority to make a positive impact in the communities they serve first while providing exceptional services in roofing and exteriors. From start to finish, Tar Heel Construction Group proved to be a reputable and dependable contracted solution. Their quality installations and good communication kept me informed and reassured throughout the entire process. It's no wonder they have been voted Harford's best roofing contractor and best home improvement contractor for three years running. But here's what really impressed me. Tar Heel Construction Group's commitment to continued service and registered warranties. They stand behind their work, ensuring that I have peace of mind for years to come. What's even more remarkable is their dedication to giving back to the community. They aggressively support and uplift the neighborhoods they serve, making a positive difference in people's lives. I feel incredibly grateful and humbled to have chosen Tar Hill Construction Group for my roof. They have earned my trust and respect for being the only contractor to be voted Harford's best roofing contractor and Baltimore's best roofing contractor in the same year. So if you're looking for top-notch roofing and exterior solutions, look no further than Tar Hill Construction Group. Visit their website at tarheelconstructiongroup.com or give them a call at 410-638-7021. Again, that's 410-638-7021. Experience the excellence and community impact for yourself. Tar Hill Construction Group, building excellence one roof at a time.